أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير إن بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like first of all to uh, thank the community for their support and quick response in helping put this program together particularly our Imam Abdul Nasir and the members of the Shura here and secondly, and very importantly, the people and the volunteers, and particularly Brother Rami at uh, High Productions, who came all the way here voluntarily to help broadcast this session live, because a few hundred people attend the session online, live every week, so the, all the people's efforts are much appreciated. A lot of times we see these kinds of programs, and the efforts that are behind the scenes don't get appreciated. So we pray that Allah Azza wa accepts every second of everyone's efforts, inshaAllah ta'ala. So we have reached in our series a discussion on uh, Surah Al-Buruj. Up until now, a few surahs have come in which there is the mention of the sky in the beginning. So the, the surah right before this was, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ Again, the sky was mentioned in the beginning. إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ We found. Then there was mention of the sky here and there, even in, the between, in between the passages. وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ وَفُتِحَتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ أَبْوَابًا أَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا أَمْ As-sama, sama, 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 sama. In, in the series of surahs, these clusters of Makki surahs at the end, you find a lot of mention of the sky. But we found that most of the time the mention of the sky was in the context of the destruction of the sky. It was in the context of the destruction of the sky. Even in the previous surah, إِذَا sama unshaqqat, When the sky is completely torn beyond repair, <laughs> in shiqaq is complete tearing, absolute tearing. You can't put it back together now. And so, and at that point, the, the predominant theme of the previous surah, as was mentioned last week, was inevitability. The inevitable role of the sky is to be torn. That's what it was created for. That was its eventual goal. You know, when somebody's in college, you say, your goal is to graduate. And every day, this, this person's in college, they're thinking about graduation day. Well, Allah let us know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the sky, when it was created, with its incredible expansive universe, 
It was created for one day, the day on which it will be torn. Which is why the next ayah said, "Wa adinat li Rabbiha wa hukat." It's intently listening for the commandment of its Lord, waiting for that commandment that it can fulfill its destiny of being torn. And it's, it's only rightful that it should do so. وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ This is what we learned in the previous surah. But this, the sky being torn is not happening now. This is an event of the future. This is not something that's happening now. So now in the next surah, this surah that we're studying today inshaAllah, the study is not that of inevitability, the study of what is now and what has already occurred in the past. So where the predominant beginnings of the surahs were of the future, here we have a discussion of the present, the shawahid, the things you can see right now, and the things that have already borne witness, the testimonies of the past. So we begin with the mention of the strength of the sky. Allah swears by the sky, was sama. One of the things that needs to be mentioned here before we go any further, is the functions of oaths, the aqsam. We, know, we talk about this all the time, but it's important to review. When Allah Azza wa Jal swears by something, there are a few reasons. One of them, according to traditional scholars, is the importance of whatever he swears by, the magnitude, the greatness. So when Allah swears by the sun, He's letting us know that the sun is nothing small. It's nothing minuscule. It's a profound creation of Allah. It's an amazing thing. So when Allah swears by the sky, it is magnified the sky. Right? That's one obvious thing. But there are other things. Typically in language, an oath is taken when there is anger. Like in, when we talk to each other, I say, I swear I'm going to kill you. I swear you better stop. You do that when you're angry, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal, oftentimes He swears in Qur'an when there is what? Anger. When there's anger. But then there are other functions. For instance, the oath is used in language when you're not being believed. We talked about this last time too. When you're not being believed. So when you come in late to work and you say, I was, you know, I got stuck in traffic and the boss gives you a funny look, you say, I swear I got stuck in traffic. You swear to make yourself more believable, right? So that's, the, the speaker will take an oath or swear when the audience is not believing him. So there's anger, there's the skepticism of the audience. But then in classical Arabic, another function, that to take whatever Allah swears by and make it a witness. So for example, when I say, I swear by, and we don't say this for creation, but hypothetically, if I swear by this person, that means I have brought this person as a witness for what I'm about to say. So when Allah says, وَالسَّمَاءِ I swear by the sky. In, in common English we would say, I swear by the sky. Then Allah has made the sky a witness. But when you bring a witness, isn't it for some kind of case? When you bring a witness to testify, it's for something that you're going to say. This is called jawab al-qasam. What is, this, what is this, this sky a witness to? That's what will come a little bit later on. But let's first note what else Allah said about the sky. He says, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ that in Arabic is a possessive, it's an idafa, it's, it's a mudaf that illustrates possession. The sky possessing, or po the sky that is the possessor of al-buruj. Buruj comes from the word barj. Also the, the verb baraja. B uh, or burj even. Burj is a tower or a fort. Anything that's very high, you have to look up to see it, that's burj. Okay, anything stellar is burj. Large st stars in the sky are also called burj. Some of the people of the, you know, ancient, this was not a historical science, like in the science in the sense of we think of science now, but the ancient peoples, they used to have all these ulum and nujum, you know, the sciences of the stars, and they would read the stars for all kinds of things. Even nowadays we have some sort of thing, horoscopes, which are horrendously evil, right? But anyway, we have those things. But back in the old days, they used to have this idea that the sky is divided into 12 areas. This is not from Islam, this is from Jahiliyyah, right? And they would, each of them was called a burj. Each is a cluster, is a large you know, section of the sky called a burj. Nonetheless, the majority opinion on this word is actually وَهِيَ النُّجُومَ الْعِظَامِ like Ibn Kathir says. These are the large stars in the sky. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal swears by. But still, the word you know, ذَاتِ uh, buruj as opposed to ذَاتِ الْكَوَاكِبْ ذَاتِ nujum, right? In previous surahs, we found the word nujum. We found the word kawakib, وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ انْتَثَرَتْ Right? وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ انْكَدَرَتْ We found nujum and kawakib. But buruj, why specifically buruj? There's some benefits to this. A fort, the sky is being told to us that the sky is full of forts. In a fort, who, who goes inside the fort? Who's inside the fort? Soldiers. Right? Who are the soldiers in the sky? The angels. So the angels are positioned in military positions all over the, the universe. And the large stars that we see, Allah is making us subhanahu wa ta'ala visualize the forts of the angels that are stationed in the sky. 
A day is coming when they will leave those camps and they will be called to duty. You know how you get drafted for a job in the military? They will be drafted and they will have to come down from the sky. وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا They will come down from the sky in rows upon rows. But right now they are stationed in those forts, in those encampments. But we'll see why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this as the surah continues. A few other things about how uh, the buruj have been explained in, in classical texts. Uh, some say qusur fi sama, same idea, forts or castles in the sky. Al buruj allati fi al haras, the uh, you know the the forts in which there are you know strong armies sitting. Of course, the armies of angels. Now this is actually a continuation of a previous discussion. Previously, there was an allegation made by the mushrikun that the Quran is not the word of Allah, that this is the word of some jinn shayateen. They get it from the sky and they give it to him, and he speaks on behalf of these. Jinn. So they called him Majnoon. Like we read before, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُون Right? But this, now we're being told, when the jinn try to go into the sky, what's the security system? The sky full of buruj. They, you can't get past them. And then they get shihab and thaqib thrown towards them, so the sky is protected. And the revelation comes from that sky, so that revelation itself is protected. The, the, the jinn, the shayateen, have no access to it. The other thing also finally, وَأَصْلُ الْبَرْج of Zuhur. The, the essence of the word Burj is manifestation. So the most brilliant, the most stellar skies and the stars in the sky. This is really important how we connect this to the previous surah. Like Islahi comments for example. We learned that in the previous surah the sky was being destroyed. It was completely being destroyed. But it's not being destroyed now. When you look out in the desert sky, not like in, you know, in most of the countries polluted so we don't really see stars in the sky like we should, unless you go out and you know, really out there in the desert or in the wilderness. But imagine the desert Arab. When he looks out in the sky, what does he see? Just this bed of stars. It's all over the place. And some of the most brilliant stars, right? And it's something he can't avoid. You have to understand this also. For the Arab, there's not a lot of skyscrapers or big billboards or highway lights that take away from the attention to the sky. Nowadays when we drive, we don't pay attention to the sky. But in the back in the day, what is there to distract you from looking at the sky? There's this desert and then there is sky. You can't avoid it. So now the attention is being called to something you can't avoid to begin with. And every time you look at the sky, how many times has the discussion of the sky already been mentioned? Over and over and over again. Every time you look at the sky, what comes to your mind? إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ وَفُتِحَتِ السَّمَاءُ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ السَّمَاءُ مُنْفَطِرٌ بِهِ Over and over and over again, you're just reminded this sky is going to collapse. It can't wait to do so. So those, those brilliant stars are like reminders, like you know how even nowadays in buildings when there's alarm codes, the light goes off, right? The star's light going off is like an alarm for the human being, reminding him that this sky is about to come to an end. It's meant to do so. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوج And that, that looking at the sky and that reflection, it leads us to, to that reminder that Allah has promised a day that's coming where this is going to happen. So what's the next ayah? وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ The promised day. وَعَدَ يَعِدُ وَعْدًا Right or idatan in Arabic. This means to promise. Allah says, "I swear by the promised day, that day that He has been promising over and over and over again in previous surahs, like in the, pre- the surah right before this one, He said, 'Ya ayyuha al-insan, inna ka kadihun ila Rabbika kadhan famulaqi. Human being, you, you, oh you human being, you are marching forward in great diligent effort towards your Lord. Then you will meet Him. When will you meet Him? On the promised day." So in the, now here we have the second oath. Allah swears first by the sky full of stellar star, stars and forts and the encampments of the angels, and second by the promised day. One thing I should have mentioned that I didn't mention, the context, the historical context of this surah. In previous surahs, different kinds of crimes of the disbelievers have been mentioned. We started this series with Surah Al-Naba, and the, their, the crime was, you know what the crime was? Ridiculing the concept of a hereafter. عَمَّا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَأِ الْعَظِيمِ What are they asking about? They're poking fun, they're making questions about this huge event. How dare they ask about this? How is this something to poke fun at? The resur- resurrection day, the last day, the day of reckoning. This was one crime. Then we read further and there were other kinds of crimes. There was a crime against the Messenger وسلم, calling him insane. Then there was a crime against the Qur'an itself calling it the word of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ He responds to that. So there were all these crimes, and then we went to different crimes. For example, they used to kill the baby girl. بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ They used to kill the baby girl because this was a humiliation for them. 
Then we went further, we found other kinds of crimes. وَيْلُوا لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا كَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ These business people, they cheat, they scrape a little bit off the top to make a little bit extra on the side that nobody would notice. The IRS won't come back to them or the customer won't come back to them because it's only like 1% that they stole. Nobody can catch them on that much. Different kinds of crimes were mentioned. Different kinds of crimes were mentioned. But you know when the kuffar are exposed and their criminal behavior is exposed, this crime of killing the baby girl for example, or the crime of cheating people in business, is this something that only hurts the Muslims or hurts other people too? It hurts other people too. It's a crime against, you could call it a crime against humanity. It's a social evil. So when they start getting exposed to their own people, they start getting angry. These Muslims, we're okay if they talk about what's gonna happen to the sky at the very end. We're okay if they talk about ancient nations of the past. They shouldn't be talking about us right now. Leave us alone. Talk about other stuff, we're okay with you. Don't talk about us and our problems, leave us alone. But did the Sahaba and did the Messenger وسلم, leave their evils alone? No. Quran starts addressing their particular evils, calling them out, exposing them to their own society. And when this happens, those who oppress, those who are just making fun of the Messenger, calling him insane, you know, character assassination, it's called in media, right? You call somebody insane, so that whatever they say doesn't get taken seriously. When none of this worked, and the work is still going on, and the Sahaba are more and more diligent in these efforts, and now they're even beginning to expose the evils of that society. So instead of them being discredited, the leaders of Quraysh are being discredited, slowly before their society. What's the only thing left to do? The only thing left to do now is to oppress these Muslims. If you can't, you know, if you can't silence them by poking fun at them, if you can't silence them by making lies against them, if you can't silence them by calling them insane or crazy or whatever, if none of that works, the only thing left to do is torture them, beat them, beat them to be quiet, scare them into silence. Right? This is the tactic of the Fara'ina. So we find later on in this surah also mention of Fir'aun, who tried to scare people into silence also. Right? But before we get to that here, the people who oppressed, you know in Mecca, Muslims didn't have an army. Muslims didn't have much of, of any arsenal or large numbers. It was a very small number of people. And even the small numbers we had, some of them young children, Right? Like Ali radiallahu anhu, very young. Women are involved. Old people are involved. Then non-Arabs, like you know, uh, resident aliens, they're involved and they don't have citizenship, so they don't have all the rights. You know, the Quraysh can get, up, get away with beating them up. Slaves are involved, they have no rights whatsoever. Right? So all of these people are subject to persecution. And when you persecute these people and nobody can question you, you feel like you're the big guy and these guys, what are they going to do in response? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of this surah is actually this is a call or this is an announcement of the support of the believer. Why? Who does Allah send to help his believers? Who does Allah send? You know, at the battle of Uhud, who did Allah send? Or at the battle of Badr, who did Allah send? The angels. Yumdidkum Rabbukum bi khamsati alafim minal malaikati musawibin at Uhud this was promised. Bala in tasbiru wa tattaku wa yatukum min fawrihim hada yumdidkum rabbukum bi khamsati alafin. Your Lord will extend for you with 5,000 angels on branded horses, ready for battle, angels being sent from the sky. And these angels, of course, they're military angels, and we're military angels stationed in the Buruj. In the Buruj. So when the Muslim is being oppressed, he shouldn't think he's alone. He shouldn't think there's no defense. Allah has defense for him. It's in the sky, it's ready to go. It's ready to go. And not only is it ready to go, Allah swear by it. And we said when you swear by something, you make it a witness. So those angels are witnessing. These forts are witness to what is going on on the earth. And so this is the first thing. This is the first threat to the kuffar who attempt to persecute the believers. The second threat, before even the angels come and take care of them, which can happen at any time, فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيدُ We will read in this surah. He can do whatever he wants. But before that even, there's another threat, a bigger threat than even the angels, which is the day that has been promised. وَالْيَوْمِ mawud. So he, promised, he swears by the next thing, وَالْيَوْمِ mawud. But then the next ayah, this to me personally, after all the, uh, the studies we've been doing, I can tell you with full confidence, this next one is my favorite ayah in the whole Qur'an. Just two words. وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ if you just appreciate the beauty and the power and the complexity and the depth of these two words, I'll start with a basic English translation. The, both words come from the same origin, shahida yashhadu, shahada. Okay? Shahida means to bear witness. Also means to be present in before something. فَهُوَ شَاهِدْ أَيْهُوَ حَاضِرْ Somebody shahid means they're present. 
They're right before someone, so that's why they were witness. So to be a witness, you have to be present. Also, shahid, one of the meanings of shahid is nasir, helper. Why? You know Allah says, وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُم مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ Call your shuhada other than Allah to produce the likes of Qur'an. Why? You're the, the best helpers are the people that are right there by your side. You don't have to call them and they're, they go to voicemail or they're not available. They're right there next to you, so they're shuhada. Right? Allah didn't even call on ansar. وَدْعُوا أَنصَارَكُم مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ He said, وَدْعُوا shuhada Because they're right there. They're right there witness to this challenge. Right? So anyway, the word shahid means a witness. Shahid is the one who is engaged in the act of witnessing. If you're standing out on the street and you see a car accident, you will be the shahid. The word for you will be shahid. And what you saw, what did you see in the, in, on the street? Car accident? Whatever you saw will be called mashhud. I say, Allah says, I swear by the witness, and I swear by that which has been witnessed. Okay? I swear by the witness, and by that which has been witnessed. Now to make that short, I swear by the shahid, and I swear by what? The mashhud. Mashhud. Now there are many, 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 many things. This, by the way, these two words, why, why is this my favorite ayah in the Qur'an? This is a summary of all of Islam. These two words are a summary of our entire deen. This is a summary of almost the entire Meccan Qur'an. Almost the entire Meccan Qur'an. This is a summary of the entire agreement we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's explore some of the ways in which these two words encompass the, the, the full spectrum of the teachings of this deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ مَجْمُوعٌ لَهُ النَّاسِ وَذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ مَشْهُودٌ The day of judgment is a day to be witnessed. The day of the judgment in another place in the Qur'an, ذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ مَشْهُودٌ That is a day to be witnessed. It is mashhud. So who's the shahid? We are. We are shahid and the day of judgment is mashhud. So all of the previous surahs that describe إِذَا السَّمَاءُ انشقت, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ انفطرت, إِذَا البحار فجرت, إِذَا البحار سجرت, إِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ all of, إِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُجِّرَتْ right? إِذَا النُّشُورُ uh, إِذَا الصُحُفُ نُشِرَتْ So all of those things are mashhud and we are what? Shahid. We're the witness and all of that's going to be witness. So that entire scenery in the Qur'an, that is hundreds of ayat depicting what we will see on the Day of Judgment, is mashhud. And us become what? Shahid. Just in those two words. وَشَاهِدٍ in وَمَشْهُودٍ Look at it another way. All of the creation of Allah, all of the creation of Allah is screaming La ilaha illallah. Every creation of Allah is shahid. Every creation of Allah is shahid. And you know what the mashhud is? La ilaha illallah. That is mashhud. That is another testimony of the Qur'an. Then we find the people who pass by, you know the Arabs used to travel a lot. And did they travel by nations that were destroyed and their ruins? Right? They used to see the ruins of old nations, like the ruins of Thamud and Ad and things like that. Right? So when they would pass by, they're watching it, so what does that make them? It makes them shahid, and what they saw is what? Mashhud. Right? So the, the evidence of previous nations that rebelled and were destroyed, they are shahid, and those ruins themselves are mashhud. Another reminder has been given to them, wa shahid wa mashhud. Then Allah says, by the way, the, the, on the other way around is also true. The ruins themselves are a witness. Not only are they being witnessed, they themselves are a witness. They themselves are a witness. And you know what the mashhud then is? The mashhud is the power of Allah, the justice of Allah. Those ruins are a witness that Allah brings justice when people rebel. That Allah does not let a nation go by, let, let things slip. So we are a witness to the ruins, and the ruins are a witness to Allah's justice subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we find some of the salaf say things like, Ashahid Allah. The shahid is Allah. The witness is Allah. Allah is witnessing everything that's happening. So for example, we find uh, uh, Sa'id ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu say, when he said, Ashahid hu Allah, he read, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ shahida." Allah is enough as a witness. Allah is enough as a witness. So Allah is shahid and we are mashhud. We are the ones that Allah is witnessing, subhanAllah. Then we find in, the, in previous discourse, in previous surahs, we find another kind of shahid. Allah said, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَبُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ There are angels over here. What do they do? You know what their job is? يَعْلَبُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَاتِبِينَ Right? They're writing away and they know what you do. So what are they doing? They're witnessing. Right? They're, they're witnessing. So they're, sh- they're shuhada, they're shahideen. And whatever we are doing is mashhud. They are shahid and our actions are mashhud. Then we go for, further on, on the judgment day. This is really powerful. 
In this previous example, I told you the angels are shahid and we are mashhud. This is what's going on right now. But on the day of judgment, what are we going to start seeing come from the sky? The angels? So we will become shahid and the angels will become mashhud. Right now, the angels are shahid and we are mashhud. And on the day of judgment, it will be reversed and they will become mashhud and we will become the shahid. We'll be witnessing them. We'll be the ones bearing witness to the descent of the angels. Then we find really beautiful, again in previous discourse of these same series of surahs, we found the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a shahid. And Jibreel alayhi salam taking over the entire horizon is mashhud. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ He saw him over the clear horizon. The Messenger was witness sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Jibreel alayhi salam. Then we find, this is very comprehensive study, I'm just giving you glimpses of shahid and mashhud all over the Qur'an. Just glimpses, this is not everything. But another place I told you, whenever Allah takes an oath, whatever He takes an oath by is what? Is a witness, is shahid. So for example, when Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Time is shahid. And the fact that you and I are in loss is what? Mashhud. Time is like, a, think of time as a guy watching us go into loss. He's a witness that we're going into loss, subhanAllah. Time itself is a witness. Time has seen many of us come and go. A thousand years ago, there was somebody who wanted to buy a house and get his kids married and you know, save some money and take care of the farm or whatever. And they went and they left. They came, they, were, they, they went through their youth, old age and died and left. And time watched them go through this. They came and they lost. Then other people came and ran after the same things and lost. Then other people came. Who's been watching this drama all along? Who's been witness to this all over and over again? People running after loss. This is time. Asr inna linsana lafi khus. So Asr is shahid and we are, our loss is mashhud. Similarly, we find in the Quran, Qalu shahidna ala anfusina. On the day of judgment, we will say, we bear witness, we are shahid against ourselves. Ala anfusina. We are shahid against ourselves. And then it becomes even more graphic. Allah says, Yawma tashhadu alayhim alsinatuhum wa aydihim wa arjuluhum. Subhanallah. The day on which their, their tongues, their hands and their feet will be shahid, tashhadu alayhim. They will bear witness against who? Their own selves. Their, over everything that they used to do. Notice the sequence here. It's really, it's a side note, but it's an important note. Allah says, their tongue will bear witness. Then He says, their hands will bear witness. And then He says what? What's the third one? Their feet will bear witness. There's a, good, there's a beautiful sequence here. Which one does the most crimes? The tongue. So it's first. Who does the crime, most crimes after the tongue? The hands. And then the least? The feet. The feet lead you to where your tongue and your hands are used. So there's a sequence of the one that has to testify the most to the one that has to testify the least. Subhanallah. Then we go further. Again, Shahid wa Mashhud continues. The Messenger of Allah is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَكَيْفَ جِئْنَا مِن كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا When he heard this ayah recited by the Sahabi, he couldn't even listen anymore. He just said, Hasbuk, I can't take anymore. The Messenger is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he has to be a witness against who? Us. He will be brought as a witness against all of us. And his testimony is of two kinds. On the one hand, we find his shafa'a, his intercession. On the other hand, we find, Ya Rabb, inna qawm ittakhadu hadhal Qur'ana mahjura. My nation, this, my Lord, this nation of mine, they abandoned the Qur'an. They took the Qur'an and left it. Two kinds of testimony, two kinds of shahada of the Messenger, and we are the mashhud. Our behavior, our, our, our actions, our legacy is mashhud. Similarly, this ummah is shahid and mashhud. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَكُونُوا shuhada عَلَى nas." So all of you, all of you, that we've, we've been turned into an ummah, all of you be, may be a witness, and who will be mashhud? What are we witness to? The truth of Islam against who? All of humanity. وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ shahida. The messenger will be a witness against you. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا وَنَذِيرًا The messenger is told, we have sent you as a shahid. We have sent you as a witness. So he is going to witness, bear witness to these things. Then we find an interesting case with Isa alayhi salam. I want to give you just some glimpse of the, the depth of these words and how they encompass such beauty before we go forward. And then we'll see how these two simple words set the course and the tone for the rest of the surah. The next is the case of Isa alayhi salam. The Hawariyuna Isa alayhi salam, they asked him something. They said, Wash had bi anna muslimun. 
when they believed in Isa alayhi salam, times were tough. The followers of Isa alayhi salam, the true followers, were oppressed. So when they made the commitment to follow this messenger, Rabbana amanna bima anzalta, wattaba'na rasula. Right? They, they said this. We've believed, we've come to believe in what you sent, and we're following the messenger. Where we followed the messenger. So they told Isa alayhi salam, Washhad bi anna muslimun. You be a shahid that we are Muslim. When we go to Allah, you need to stand before Allah and give shahada. You be the witness that we were Muslims. We submitted to Allah. So they want their lawyer to be who? Isa alayhi salam. They want Isa alayhi salam to make a case for them. But you, you know what happened to the followers of Isa alayhi salam or the supposed followers over generations? Did they keep their Islam or did they lose their Islam? They lost their Islam. So we find in the Qur'an, this ummah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when they speak to the people of the book, we are told to say, Ishhadu bi anna muslimun. Look at the change. Now we tell the people of the book, you bear witness that we are Muslim. They told Isa alayhi salam, bear witness that they are Muslim. Now we have to tell them, because they lost their Islam, at least you testify, you hate us so much, at least guarantee us, you will testify before Allah that we were Muslims. <laughs> Ishhadu bi anna muslimun. Subhanallah, how the tables have turned. Then we find this dua. It's a beautiful, beautiful dua. Those who follow the messengers in tough times. And in our times, those who remain on the mission of the messengers, may Allah make us from them. We say, فَكْتُبْنَا مَعَ shahidin. Write us in among those who bear witness. You know when Allah said, we are witness over humanity? We want to be from those who fulfilled that job. So we ask Allah to make us from those who are shahid to that, to that task of living up to the mission of Islam. Then a, a couple more inshaAllah ta'ala, the kuffar. Shahideen ala anfusihim bil kufr. In this day and age, in this, in, in this world, not even in the future, right now, they testify against themselves with kufr. They will take their kufr with pride. They will declare it and bear witness to it, testify to it with pride. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in his last address. The ummah is right in front of him. You know, this is a, a, a more nervous scene for him than the scene we saw of Ibrahim alayhi salam or Yaqub alayhi salam when he was on the deathbed and he was talking to his kids. That scene was depicted for us in Quran. Am kuntum shuhada id hadara Yaqub al maut. Were you around when death presented itself to Yaqub? Were you there? But uh, even a, a more nerve wracking scene is when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi salam is giving his address to this ummah. Because now he's, he's the last messenger, there's no more messengers coming. So if this ummah fails, and they fall into shirk, like has every other nation before, did they eventually fall into misguidance? They did. But every time what came after that, another messenger came to fix things up. Is there anyone else coming? No. So can you imagine the grief and the concern, and the worry, and just the, the, just the nervousness of the messenger wasallam when he's giving this address to the ummah? So he made sure, he covers himself. He said, Allahum mashhad, Allahum mashhad, Allahum mashhad. Oh Allah, you be witness. I did my job. I'm leaving it to them now. You be witness, I did. Allahum mashhad, subhanallah. This is a very, very powerful, powerful legacy of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, after all of these depictions of shahid and mashhud in the Qur'an, let's turn to what we find in the jamhur. In, a, in a, a large numbers, the sahaba had an opinion that comes from a hadith that is mursal. In Sayyid al-ayyam yawm al-jum'ah, wa huwa shahid wal mashhud yawm al-arafa. The opinion among the salaf is that the shahid, the witness, is the day of Friday. The day of Friday is a witness. What that means is when we attend the Friday prayer, on the day of judgment, that Friday prayer, that day, is going to testify in our favor. It will bear witness that we came. It will bear witness that we came. And that confirms our shahada. And then the Yawm Arafah is not something that happens every, day, every week. When does it happen? Every when? Once a year. And you can't do that at every masjid like Jumu'ah. You have to go to it. So it is something that is witnessed. So it is mashhud. Jum'ah is shahid and uh, Yawm Arafah is mashhud Because it's not just a time, it's also a place It's the region of Arafah that has to be witnessed You have to be there to perform that ritual So that is called mashhud Now in the context of this surah In the context of this surah We've talked about a lot of implications and beautiful variations of meaning All of these, these rich meanings inside shahidin wa mashhud Wa shahidin wa mashhud But within the context specifically of this surah the, two, the first two ayat, the first ayah is shahid and the second ayah is mashhud. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ Who's shahid? The sky is the witness. 
The sky is a witness to what's going on on the earth. The sky full of those stellar scars, t- stars with the armies of the angels are a witness to what's going on on the earth. And what is that which is going to be witnessed? The day of, the day that has been promised, وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ وَشَاهِدٍ is actually a culmination of وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ And مَشْهُودِ is a culmination of وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ They're tied together. Now we go forward. You know, in oaths, in, and, and I, I've explained this before, but you need to understand it, just review it, it helps, because it's a complex topic. The oath in the Qur'an has to have a response. Like in, in English, sometimes you say, I swear. Then the guy says, you swear what? You say, I swear I'm going to come on time. Right? So there's I swear, that's, that's called qasam. I'm going to come on time is called jawab al-qasam. The response to the oath. What did you swear to? What was it that you were talking about? But sometimes when you swear, it's obvious what you're talking about. Like your kids are uh, making a lot of noise. Right? And you walk into the room and you don't say, I swear you better be quiet. You know what you say? I swear. You don't say anything else. Is it understood that you should be quiet? It's obvious, right? In that context, it's clear. Allah has taken an oath in the last series of surahs many, many, many times to one thing. عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا أَحْضَرَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخَرَتْ Every person will know what they have to present for themselves. Every person will know what they sent forward, what they left behind. Meaning their deeds. So when Allah swears in this surah, does it have to be mentioned again? What is obvious? What is obvious and even more obvious that the qasam is the jawab al-qasam wal yawm al-ma'ud. The promised day, that's what Allah is swearing by, that that day is coming. So He swears by that day as an, in a, as an evidence in and of itself. It's not something that needs further elaboration. So the subject continues. Some have argued that qutila ashabul ukhdud, the next ayah, is the response to the oath. From the language point of view, that isn't a strong opinion. Because to be the response, to be jawab al-qasam, you have to have a lam. A lamb on it. For example, we let, we read, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالشَّفَقِ وَاللَّيْلِ وَمَا وَسَقْ وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَسَقْ These are wa 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 oaths. Allah swears. But the next ayah is جواب القسم. How do we know it's جواب القسم? لا لا تركبنا طبقا عن طبق. There's a lamb there. The lamb is جواب القسم. Here there's no lamb, so this is not جواب القسم. جواب القسم is محذوف. It's understood. Some grammarians have argued that جواب القسم is way down in the end of the surah. إِنَّ بَطْشَ رَبِّكَ لَشَدِيدٌ That is the response of the oath. That also from a language point of view is weak because usually the oath and its response are supposed to be right next to each other. And that's normal in language. You don't say, I swear, and then you start talking about something else, and then let me tell you what I was swearing about. You don't do that later. You do it right next to each other. right? So that's why that opinion is also not very strong. The strongest position from a language point of view is that the response to the oath is understood. It's implied that we will all have to present whatever we've earned May Allah make that easy upon all of us. Allah Azza wa Jal changes the subject. Now the sky has been mentioned, the promised day has been mentioned, the witness and that which is witnessed has been mentioned. Now Allah brings the reality, gives us a history lesson. He says, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْخُدُودِ You know, you, the Muslims are not the first to be oppressed. The followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are not the first to be tortured or ridiculed or, the, or, or you know, killed even, or killed. They're not the first. Allah speaks of a people much in the past, and the language He used is absolutely in- impeccable and remarkable from many, many angles. We'll try to highlight some of those things, inshallah. The word qutila in Arabic is a past tense, passive verb. It's called mabni ala al majhul. Okay, qutila literally means he was killed. Qutila means he was killed. But in Arabic language, sometimes these kinds of words are used not to speak literally, but to curse. And I don't say that lightly. Like if I say about someone, you know, قُتِلَ فُلَانٌ That means, may that guy be killed. I hope he gets killed. That's how we say it nowadays. I hope he gets killed. But the way you would say that in ancient Arabic is, قُتِلَ فُلَانٌ Okay? Fulan is so and so. Okay? So I hope so and so gets killed. Right? Now here Allah says, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْخُدُودِ Allah is sending a curse upon a certain group of people. What's their name? The people of al Ukhdud in Arabic, this is uh, um, the jam'ah, the plural of it is akhadid. Let's talk about that a little bit. الشق العظيم المستطيل في الأرض كالخندق وجعه أخاديد. This is a, a rectangular shaped ditch in the earth that people dig. It's supposed to be really deep. It's, it's not natural, it's artificial, right? It's dug, dug by human beings. And it's, it's very big, it's very large, and it's rectangular shape. These are the properties of uh, uh, the Ukhdud. Allah says the people of the Ukhdud 
May, may they be destroyed. May they be killed, violently killed. Now why would Allah curse upon the people that dig a ditch? What's wrong with the ditch? The thing is, this is, there's a long hadith narration which we're not gonna go into but your homework assignment for yourselves. Read Tafsir ibn Kathir, it has the full narration in it, inshallah. Or uh, Al-Qurtubi also has it. But I'll give you the gist of it. Essentially the hadith speaks of a believing boy who was the only, or, or, or took influence from another Muslim and then defied the ruler and the, the magician of the time. And as a result, there were, and there were some karamat that Allah gave this child that he couldn't be killed unless you say Allah's name. And when he was finally killed, the entire town became Muslim. And as a response, all of the civilians were dropped into ditches and burnt alive by the king, by the ruler king. Okay? They were dropped into ditches and burned alive. So this horrible, this heinous crime is being reminded of. But the ulama of the salaf, like As-Sabuni, Rahimahullah, Ash-Shawkani, others, they comment that it's not just talking about them. This crime of you know, genocide, or killing people in masses, or you know, uh, uh, human, like you know, uh, collective graves, this is even happening today. Mass graves, right? They're even dug today. And people, they just throw them in the ditch and throw explosive inside, or put fuel inside. And these kinds of horrible things have happened even in the last century. This is not ancient history. This is even, even happening now. But it's an ancient practice from many, many oppressive and tyrannical cultures. So now that hadith, the reason it's connected to this ayah is two things. When, in one narration, when the Messenger wasallam recited that full hadith, which is like a two and a half page long hadith, at the end of it he recited these ayat. Which is why that hadith is connected to these ayat. The other reason it's connected is, the wording in the hadith we find two places. فَخَدَّ أُخْدُودًا That he had uh, trenches dug, these rectangular trenches dug. So the same word ukhdud is used in the hadith. Then the other thing is, فَجَعَلَ يُلْقِيهِمْ فِي تِلْكَ الْأُخْدُودِ Then he started placing him in those ditches. That wording is used again in that hadith. So the parallel is the, the similar wording. But here's what I want to highlight for all of you inshaAllah. These criminals, they put people in the ditches. Is there another ditch waiting for them? These criminals have put you know, believers inside ditches. And that ditch has been filled with fire. النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ the next ayah is called Badal al ishtimal and nari is the, the kasra and nar is jar, it's called Badal al ishtimal What is what, what that sim- means in simple English is these ditches were filled with fire. And fire that is possessive of fuel, meaning the fire just won't go out, oil is in there, coal is in there, so it keeps blazing and the people keep screaming. Right? Now does that remind you of some other scene? What else I mean, what else would we write of in the Quran that sounds like that? A ditch, fire, fuel, hellfire. Here you have these oppressors killing, dis- killing believers in this most horrible way. But Allah says, may the people of the ditch be destroyed. Not just of the ditch that they dug for the believers, but the ditch that they have dug for who? Themselves. Not just the fire they lit on the believers, but the fire they have lit for themselves. Not just the fuel that the believers, the oil and the whatever they put in there, and the believers were turned into the fuel. But waqudu hanasu wal hijara, the fuel of that fire is people and stones that they will become the fuel themselves. The irony of the wording, subhanallah. On the one hand, they may be destroyed because of this crime, and at the same time, their punishment is their crime itself. And then here Allah says, go further. Allah says, idhum alayha qu'ud. But actually before we go to there, the word ashab, we should mention something about the word ashab before we go forward. Sahib in Arabic is, it has two things in it, muqaraba and muqarana. What that means is closeness and affiliation. A sahib is someone who's with you all the time. Okay, if you say about somebody, فَهُوَ صَاحِبُ Quran, This person is sahib of what? Of Quran. That means this person is always reading Quran. They're always talking about Quran. They're known, just they never leave its side. Right? If I say about this person, who a sahibi? This is my sahib. You know what that means? We're always hanging out together. The, the, the companions of the Prophet, what are they called? Sahabi, right? Ashab. Why? Because they're always by his side. And they're very close to him. When the Messenger was told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he is not insane, when the people were told this, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ The one who has been by your side all these years, he's not insane. You know he's been with you all these years. You know that he's not crazy. And the evidence was sahib. He, he, you've known him all along. You know how intelligent he is, that he always speaks the truth. So the evidence was in the word sahib itself. Here they're called ashabul ukhdud. There's just two things for us. 
When somebody commits a crime like that, a crime like genocide, aren't they forever known for that crime? Like even today when you say Nazi, what comes to mind? The crime, right? The Holocaust. That what comes to mind right away, it comes to mind. So when they committed this crime from then on, what did they become famous for? What was associated with them forever? That crime, Ashabul Ukhdud. But in the hellfire, will they be in that ditch forever? So in another sense, they're also Ashabul Ukhdud. They will be in the company of that fire, subhanAllah. How Allah captures the reality of this world, and it, He parallels it with the reality of the next in just two words. Quote, Ashabul Ukhdud. And these words again, they just rattle you. You know when you are, it's talking about these horrible, horrible criminals that are throwing people into a fire. They're throwing believers into a fire. And this is men, women, children. The hadith even speaks, the last ones to enter was a mother with her baby. And she was reluctant to go in the fire with her child. And the child was given the ability to speak. Who told her, you're on the truth. And she jumped in. Right? So these are innocent people, men, women, children that are being killed. Now when the people commit these kinds of crimes, you have two kinds of soldiers. There's the soldier who kills and he's only doing it because the general told him to and he's reluctant to do it, you know. He doesn't want to do that crime. And then there's the soldier who enjoys it. There's the guy who, who enjoys it. You know, the soldiers that go into a village and they'll do all kinds of crimes against people. There are those who reluctantly do it and those who, they have shaitan inside them, they, they do it and enjoy it. These, these you know, sorry excuses for human beings. We learn in the next ayah, these were the worst kinds of people. إِذْ هُمْ عَلَيْهَا The fire has been dug. These people find themselves a nice chair to sit on. Qurud, as opposed to julus, by the way. Julus in Arabic means to sit. Qurud means to sit over a long period of time. So they, at the very brink of that ditch, they would find themselves a seat, sit on and watch the whole scene. They would sit and watch. Does that mean that they were reluctant to do so? They enjoyed it. These kinds of criminals, they enjoyed it. And by the way, they won't even get to sit in that time. They will be, they, when they stand before that fire, when they stand before that fire, in the previous surah we learned about this. Allah is tying this subject with what we have already learned. These criminals that enjoyed watching the believers be tortured and killed. On the day of resurrection, this guy has handed his book behind his back in the previous surah. Okay? So, وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ Right? The guy who's handed his book behind his back. فَسَوْفَ يَدْعُوْ ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا He says, kill me now, and then he will be thrown into fire. Now think about this. And someone's thrown into a fire, what will they beg for? Kill me. Get the pain, get the pain to stop. Allah says about this guy who's about to be thrown into hellfire, he will beg for himself to be killed, and then he will be thrown into the fire. يَدْعُوْ ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا He hasn't even been thrown into the fire, but the terror is such that he'd rather not even think about facing it. He's begging for death even before. Even before. So as horrible as their crime is, as horrible as their crime is, Allah's punishment supersedes. Their, what they did, what, the pain they caused the believers, pales in comparison to what, has it, what Allah has in store for them. So, إِذْهُمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودٍ And in the previous surah, فَسَوْفَ يَعْرُوا ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا now Allah says, وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُودٍ In the beginning of the surah we read, وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ And the plural of shahid is shuhud. It came up in this ayah again. Another kind of shahada. The ayah says, and they, these people in particular, عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ Specifically over what they did with the believers, they themselves are a witness. وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ Especially what they did with the believers, they are a witness to this. Now Allah did not say يَعْمَلُونَ here. يَفْعَلُونَ He didn't say يَعْمَلُونَ Amal is something you think about and do it. The, a thought runs in your mind. Amal is like writing a book is a amal. Okay? But breathing is a fi'l, it's not a amal. It just, you don't think about it, oh, maybe I should exhale. You don't do that. It just happens. Right? This is a fi'l. What this t tells us is they didn't think twice about what they were doing with the believers. There was no thought. They, they would, nobody would step back and say, wait, maybe we shouldn't be, I mean, we're throwing a baby in there. We're throwing innocent women and children in there. We're throwing innocent people in there. Maybe we shouldn't be, the thought never occurred to them. How do we know the thought didn't even occur to them? مَا يَفْعَلُونَ يَفْعَلُونَ The fi'l, fi'l is without thought. Amal is with thought. Amal is with thought. 
And then the taqdeem of it, ma yaf'aluna, ala ma yaf'aluna, this is called jarwa majrur, it's supposed to be normally at the end. So typically, if this was an average Arabic sentence, it would be, wahum shuhudun ala ma yaf'aluna bil mu'mineen. That's how you would normally say it. Lekin, but by the way, wahum ala ma yaf'aluna bil mu'mineen. What this means, especially when it came to this, these people are good witnesses because they sat there the whole time. You know, when you, want, when you watch something, you know, an accident or whatever, you saw some glimpse of it. You saw something. I saw this guy running, I don't know what happened. But when you sat there to watch and enjoy, aren't you the most you know, reliable witness to what happened? So Allah made them the most thorough witness of their crime. وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُودِ Somebody from far away may have seen this happen and run off. He didn't see everything that happened. But these vicious criminals, they saw everything. So Allah makes them a witness. Allah makes them testify. Why should anybody else? You know in court, the guy who did the crime says innocent. And you have to bring some external witness who comes in and says, yeah, I think that was him. I think this is what happened. But I'm not sure because I was scared. But who's testifying on, the judge, on judgment day about this crime? Allah is making these criminals testify themselves. وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُودِ Their crime is mashhud and they are shahid now. وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ Another manifestation of وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ You know, نَقَم نَقَمَ in Arabic and نَقِمَ Two verbal forms. The masdal of it is نِقْمَةٌ نِقْمَة is something you, find, you, you are disgusted by. You see something in someone and you can't stand it. Whether it's good or bad is not even relevant. It's not like it's really bad. It's just you really don't like it. This is نِقْمَة Right? Somebody walks into the masjid, you don't like the color of their shirt, and you're giving them this dirty, nasty look. Right? This is niqmah. So Allah describes this word, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ what, what was so detestable that they found in them? What, was so, what, what, was made, what, what made them so hateful of the believers? What filled them with so much you know, intolerance against these believers? وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Naqam also means the urge to want to hurt the other, to take revenge against them for the offense that they've caused you. Whether they've caused you a real offense or not. You want to hurt them. You ever heard somebody say, man, that guy's wearing such stupid clothes, I want to slap him. <laughs> People say silly things like that, right? So now, oh, this guy's so annoying, I want to, you know, the customer service lady, if I ever find her. <laughs> right? This is niqmah. So the idea is these disbelievers, before they came to the point of genocide against the Muslims, just the fact that they believed in Allah was enough for them to find this disgust, this real like discomfort in them. Now, fortunately for our society, the vast majority of non-Muslims are not like this. They are not like this. This is a fortunate thing. The door to da'wah is still open. Why? Because when they see a Muslim, the first thing that doesn't come in most people, we think so, we think everybody's out to get us. It's not the case. Most people are not out to get us. They're, they're normal people, and you know you, you have to stop looking at them as weird, and they'll stop looking at you as weird. You know, that's basically what it is. I, I'm just on a side comment, we go to an Islamic program at a university, and there's a security guard. Right? Non-Muslim security guard, or a professor's office. And hundreds of Muslims are passing by their office. And the security guard. And he's providing security for the Muslims. But they're all like, yeah, kafir system security. And this, this, you know, these professors of kufr and dalala and, and we give them dirty looks. Nobody even looks them in the eye. Nobody says, hi, how's it going? Thanks for the job you're doing. No courtesy. So what would they think of us? You understand? So, but these people were believers. And there, are, there is a segment in society that no, even if you're the nicest people in the world, the, the thing that will make you the worst on the face of the earth is that you believe in Allah. That you believe in Allah. But belief in Allah is not the one that not the thing that made them hated here. Allah didn't just say, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ They didn't they didn't you know find detesting you know hatred and spiteful hatred against the believers except for the reason that they believed in Allah. That's not what Allah said. He said, إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ Two very powerful names of Allah. What did they believe about Allah specifically in this ayah? First name Aziz. It comes from Izza, in the Arabic word. Not to be confused with the Urdu word, those of you who speak Urdu. Okay? Izza in the Arabic language, it contains the meaning of authority. So they didn't just believe in a God, they believed in a God that has what? Authority. What that means is when that God speaks, 
When Allah speaks, when Allah tells me to behave, when Allah tells me to do, when Allah tells me not to do, I acknowledge His authority. You acknowledge the authority of your boss at work. You acknowledge the authority of the police officer that's standing right there. You're not going to cut the red light. You're not going to speed. You acknowledge the authority of the IRS. You acknowledge the authority of your professor who's going to fail you if you don't hand in the assignment. You acknowledge the authority of your parents. You acknowledge the authority of, you know, we acknowledge authority throughout our life. These people didn't just believe in an abstract concept of God. They believed in an Allah who has authority over them. And this was not, this is something that really got under the skin of the oppressor. Because whose authority do they want to establish? Their own. How are you taking an authority other than me? This was what irked Fir'aun. Ana rabbukum ala. That's what he said. I am your supreme Lord. Who's, what are you talking about anybody else? What other authority? Ma alimtu lakum min ilahin ghayri. What other word to worship and obey do you find besides me? I don't, I don't see how you can even think of that. Right? So the first thing was the authority of Allah. Al-Aziz. The second thing here is Al-Hamid. And Al-Hamid is the, 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 the inner conscience of the believer. You know, Hamd in Arabic is two things. Ash-shukr wa thana. It's two things. It is to have gratitude and it's to praise. The believer who came to belief in Allah recognized that this Lord of mine has done me a lot of good and I haven't done anything in return. The least I should do is believe in Him and acknowledge His authority. This is the least gratitude I can show. I appreciate all the things he's done for me. I appreciate the fact that he even gave me the privilege to say La ilaha illallah. What other choice do I have but to accept his authority? The Hamid, the Hamid is the driving force, the source code of appreciating Allah's Izza, Allah's authority. That out of Hamd of Allah, we accept his authority. You know, before Allah talks about his authority as Rabbil Alameen, Rabb is his authority. Even in the Fatiha, what did he mention first? He didn't begin the Fatiha with Rabbul Alameen. What did he begin it with? Alhamdulillah, hamd first. You acknowledge the praise of Allah. You acknowledge a Lord that's given you limbs. I didn't pay for my hands. I didn't pay for my eyes. You have the exact opposite concept with non-Muslims. They'll say, if there's a God, how come there's cancer? How come this guy, this kid is born with one eye? How come there's this? How come there's that? And we say, you know what? You people need to understand. He is Rabb. He doesn't owe you anything. You didn't sign any contract that says, five fingers on the left and five fingers on the right. And they should be equal size. You didn't, you didn't earn any of this. He gave it to you, he gave it. He didn't give it to you, it wasn't yours to begin with. To think, to say, this is my hand. The Muslim doesn't say, this is my hand. We say it temporarily, but who does it belong to? You know why this belongs to Allah? Because we say, inna lillah. We belong to Allah. <laughs> Forget my hand, or my eye, or my clothes, or my money, or my health, or my car. You know, I belong to Allah. It's a completely different attitude. So we have this hamd of Allah, which helps us appreciate His authority. Illa an yu'minu billahi al-aziz al-hamid. But then he goes further. When you acknowledge Allah's authority, when you acknowledge Allah's hamd, where do you see His authority and His hamd manifest? Alladhi lahu mulku samawati wal ard. The one to whom exclusively lahu is first. If you say alladhi mulku samawati wal ardi lahu, if you put lahu at the end. That means the ownership of the heavens and the earth is with him. But you didn't say is only with him. If you say lahu where it is in the ayah, then it's ikhtisas, ikhtisas. It's only with Allah. Alladhi lahu mulku samawati wal ard. The one exclusively in whose possession is the sovereignty. This is not milku samawat, this is mulku samawat. Two different word in Arabic, words in Arabic. Milku samawat and mulku samawat. We'll talk about that in a second. Mulk is sovereignty. The one who has sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. The surah began with something about the sky and something that happened on the earth. The sky, Allah talked about His armies. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ What was happening on the earth? قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ Now who was, who's the sovereign in the sky? الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ Who's the sovereign on the earth? وَالْأَرْضِ Meaning, yes, the angels obey Allah. يَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ They do whatever they're told. And Allah's authority is clear in the sky. But Allah's authority is also clear on the earth. Don't you think that these people did something that Allah didn't, that, you know, that they slipped under Allah's radar somehow. That they got away with it. أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ أَنْ أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ The people that commit sins, do they think they got ahead of us? Do they think they got around the security camera? سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ What a horrible decision they made. What a horrible assumption they've made. 
So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the one who belong, to whom the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth belong. Let me tell you something about sovereignty and mulk. When you're sovereign over something, that means nobody else can question what you do. A sovereign nation, what's a sovereign nation? No other nation can tell them what to do. They have their sovereign law. A sovereign ruler like an ancient king, nobody can tell him, hey king, this is a bad idea, this is a good idea. It's out of the question. They're, they have absolute authority. So, الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The one who has sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. This was part of their iman. This was even worse for the kuffar. How can they acknowledge the sovereignty of Allah? Not questioning anything from Allah. And this is the real problem in iman is not believing in a God that created the universe or created the heavens and the earth and is merciful and powerful. Most people have no problem believing that. You know where the problem starts? When you give God sovereignty, when you say He has the authority, He has complete control, and He is the only one rightful of that control. So His authority comes from His sovereignty. Why, is he, why is, does He have authority? Because He has the mulk. He owns it. I have authority over this bag because it belongs to who? It's, it's mine, that's why I have authority over it. Allah owns all of this, so He has authority over it. So at the root of all of this is Allah's milkiyah, His ownership. So here we find, الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ We'll break with this ayah inshaAllah for the salah. Let me make some comments about this last uh, statement. وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ as in regards to every single thing under imagination, everything you can imagine, Allah has been witness to it all along. The normal sentence structure again, the sentence structure is very important in the Qur'an, taqdeem and ta'khir, it's very important. Wallahu shahidun ala kulli shay. Okay? Wallahu shahidun ala kulli shay. Normally that's how you speak. Allah says, Wallahu ala kulli shay in shaheed. This, this is called uh, taqdeem. Al-Jar wal Majroor. Okay? What that does is, you can't imagine everything. You know, you don't say that normally. You don't say Allah is, uh, Allah is a witness to everything. You say Allah is a witness to everything. That's how you have to say it. Because it says, Ala kulli shay'in shaheed. This is, it highlights, this is madh. It's elevating its status in the speech. So don't you think anything escaped the witness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now understand this, there's been a gradation. We said, وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشُوهُ The witness and that which has been witnessed. The sky was a witness. The sky was a witness. Then the criminals who were committing the crime were shuhud. They were shuhud. We learned the angels are a witness too. But finally, eventually, who's the ultimate witness? Allah Himself. وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ He is shahid. He is shaheed. And everything that has happened is mashhud. It's again, it's taking that statement, وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشُوهُدٍ And it's like that seed. That is, that is you know, ripening these flowers all over the surah. Another example of shahid wa mashhud. Another example of shahid wa mashhud. So we break with this uh, ayah inshallah ta'ala and after the salah, hopefully we'll uh, finish the surah in decent time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum.